Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today Donna will talk about data catalogs, architecting for collaboration and self-service. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen to activate that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA Strategies. And if you'd like to continue the networking and conversation after the webinar and to learn more about Donna, just go to community.dataversity.net. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Donna Burbank. Donna is recon a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience in helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And with that, let me give floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, thank you. It's always a pleasure to see some familiar names on the uh, on the call. Thanks for those who joined fairly regularly. Um, so as Shannon mentioned, today's topic is on data catalogs, uh, what they are, how they're used, and particularly around architecting for collaboration and, and self-service in kind of this new world. Um, again, thanks for those who do join regularly. Those who do know that all of the previous webinars are on demand on Dataversity. I'm pretty sure to keep them indefinitely, and it's a great resource, not only my webinars, but um, a lot of other topics are out there as well. So it's a good resource for you to have after, and I know that's often one of the questions is, uh, is this available? So yes, uh, the slides and the recording itself will be available after the call. Um, so as I mentioned today, we're talking about data catalogs, um, what they are, um, how that kind of fits into specifically some ideas of self-service, because I know that you know data is hot and the more types of, of different roles looking at data um, are also looking for this idea of data catalogs, and we'll talk a little more about that. So since we are data management professionals, I like to start with definitions or the metadata around what is a data catalog, right? So I, I took this definition from Gartner, I thought it was a good one. Um, a data catalog maintains an inventory of data assets throughout the discovery, description, and organization of these distributed data sets across the organization. Really a goal is just sort of how you find and understand and extract business value from them. So it can seem like a technical thing, and there's tools out there in the market that are very technical, but you know, at its core, I think we all understand that. If you think of a library, um, we all use, well, not all of us, the old people on the call, including <laughs> myself, I actually use these card catalogs in libraries, right? I want to find a book you need some sort of catalog or index to find that information. Um, so uh, data cataloging, and in some sense, have been around for centuries, right? We've always had to find information. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about that. What's different about a data catalog, you know, compared to some of the older technologies that have been around longer, like a card catalog? Um, but I think the general concept is pretty straightforward. I have data. I need to find it. Where do you find things? You find things in a catalog. The other piece... Um, that of the Gartner definition that I like and we'll talk about on this webinar is that technology has evolved. And yes, we all use card catalogs, but we use that less and less because you have things like Google, right? So how can we use things like modern machine learning algorithms and really get the best of both worlds. The organization, you know, library, I love librarians. They've really were pioneers in data management, um, how they organize, you know, the Dewey Decimal System and how they organize vast amounts of information. So kind of riding on their shoulders and using some of that same idea of a data catalog, but using also the newer technologies and not having human, if you ever had to go scan through these manual cards, you know, that took a long time. So how can we get the best of both worlds? Uh, so we want to talk about terminology, but if, if you've heard me speak before, you know I have a little a little patience for getting too academic and, and getting ourselves tied in knots because we tend to, because of the nature of our business, we, we focus on definitions, which is great, uh, but at some point we can get ourselves turned around and, and talk too much about you know meta and definitions. So the question I often get 
and is it a data catalog or a metadata catalog? And I sort of, you know, we're going to talk meta levels, and I, I start to feel that how, how we're an Escher diagram, right, with sort of hands drawn hands, or we're getting into little layers of complexity, or are we getting too academic about that? So metadata um, is, you know, it, 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 I think we, is a, yeah, there was a webinar a few months ago, if you're interested more in what metadata is, but it's really that data about the data, the who, what, where, why, how the context is a good way to think of it around the data. So yes, we're looking for data <laughs> through a catalog, and metadata helps you find that information, and some data catalogs actually have some data in it. More likely, you're pointing to where that data is. So I'm not going to go much deeper on this, or I'll start to... Uh, do what I just accused myself of not doing, of getting too turned around in the weeds. But I wanted to call that out because we get that I've had those types of arguments that, you know, in, in discussions with data management professionals, and, and there's some overlap, and we'll talk about that, but I wouldn't get too crazy about that. Um, you're looking for data through a data catalog, which could be a metadata catalog, and there I go again. I'm going to stop, right? <laughs> there you go. I do think a helpful discussion might be, um, what's a data catalog and what's a metadata repository? Um, someone asked me that the other day, and I was sort of snarky, and I said, oh, data catalog is a sexy name for a metadata repository. We've had that forever. But there are some real distinctions, um, and I think it's worth talking about that. Um, I've had several clients that have looked at these different technologies and have picked the wrong one um, based on, on some of these differences. So I think it's worth talking through. And the blue line at the bottom is sort of the obvious statement that I wanted to call out, that this is a spectrum and tools and vendors have overlap in functionality and what metadata repository might have some data cataloging, some data catalogs might have some metadata, some master data management tools might have some. I don't want to get too into specific tools and don't ask me on the, on the questions because I never like to talk about specific tools, uh, but I will talk about functionality. But I do think in a general level, is, it, think of, of a continuum of what you're looking for. Now, you may have heard me use this analogy before, but if you think of the on the left of almost the encyclopedia approach of a metadata repository, it tends to be more strict, more business rule driven. If you think of the old days with the encyclopedia, you know, someone vetted this information, we publish it out, we truly understand the lineage of this information. Uh, whereas Wikipedia is more of a crowdsourcing approach. And, um, you know, I, I was a skeptic at the beginning with Wikipedia that, yeah, that's going to work, or just a bunch of people adding stuff in. You know, we kind of have academics for a reason, uh, and that's why we have encyclopedias. But I found I go to Wikipedia all the time, right? So you, you need to understand the use case and do I need eventual consistency of a definition or kind of the vetted approach. But I do think that's something to think about. So again, as a generalization, if we just have the category of a metadata repository, they have been around for a while. I think there's some overlap. Both metadata repositories and data catalogs have some sort of automated um, data, metadata discovery, right? That, you know, if you're doing this by hand, I wouldn't say you have either a data catalog or a metadata repository. You're back to the card catalog. Uh, both probably have some sort of search capability to find things. I will say that a lot of these new tools that sort of sell themselves as a data catalog tend to be much more intuitive. And we'll talk more about that. If think of more a Google search approach than looking through an encyclopedia approach. Um, and so, but that's the beauties in the eye of the beholder. You know, I, I do think what was intuitive to one person may not be too intuitive to another. Um, but metadata repositories often, and again, generalization can be more on the technical side. With that, though, you get some robust capability like data lineage. So think of the classic, I have a, a KPI on a dashboard, and I want to see the source to target mappings of, of the through lineage of how that was defined. What are the business rules? What are the ETL rules? What are the security line, lineage of you know, PII? And sort of where is that found? Impact analysis of change. I have a field, and I'm going to change that field. What else is impacted, right? So. Um, the other big difference is more in that Wikipedia encyclopedia. If you're thinking on the metadata side, if you really want to enforce a standard, right, and there's a bit of a difference here. I have that, I don't know, last name field needs to be character 50, and it must be character 50, and we're going to have that. Um, we're going to have the definition of a customer is X, and the fields on this are PII, and we want to cascade that through the systems and enforce my software development on that. I want to have standards and rules alignment that tends to be more on the metadata repository side. 
um, on the data catalog, again, the title of this was more around collaboration and, and user self-service. A lot of these data catalogs are sort of more of a lighter touch on purpose because the purpose is more collaboration, um, light touch enforcement. Think of a catalog is more of, if I'm looking at a catalog of clothing, right? I'm just finding the clothing. I'm not enforcing the sizes of the clothing or how the prices of the clothing. I'm just trying to find a pair of shoes online. And so that's more of the data catalog approach. I think a lot of them, and again, not that no metadata repositories have these, um, but that idea of collaboration and like buttons and user ranking uh, tends to be more on the data catalog side. Some of these data catalog tools actually sell themselves as sort of analytic uh, team collaboration tools, unless you, know, you don't hear the word metadata repository as much, partly because it's not as sexy <laughs> and partly because it is a different thing. And I think it's good when the vendors are clear, is, is it a data catalog where I'm trying to just get up get an inventory of my information, or am I really trying to do more of a data lineage enforcement? And again, neither is right or wrong. You don't have to even have one tool over the other. Maybe some tools have both of these um, functionalities that you're looking at and you can get both. So just the example is I, I had one client, for example, that chose one of these data catalogs because the user interface was really nice, and I agree with them. It was easy to use. The good side is they got all of their analysts bought into using it. Anyone here who's been trying to get a metadata initiative up can realize that can be a cultural challenge. Um, so having the, the easy to use user interface, getting information out there, the collaboration was great, but then they were trying to use it for really strict governance, PII enforcement, rules enforcement, data lineage, and the tool broke down, and they'd already bought the tool, and the problem is they'd gotten the buy-in, and then it couldn't do what they were doing. So that was run risk. The other risk is, and especially the technical folks, I'm one of them on this call, it can be really sexy to see full data lineage and impact analysis if that's what you're doing from the tech team. Um, but maybe your business users want more of just a glossary uh, approach or a um, you know easy to use user interface. Um, and some of these metadata repository tools are powerful, but not as, as intuitive. And so you shouldn't have to choose between one or the other, but the reality in the market is and that that can often be the case. So just think of it as you're looking for a tool. Think of your audience. Think of which one you want. Is it a, a catalog and collaboration, or is it a metadata repository and rules and enforcement? Um, and then realize that it's a spectrum between all of these. So uh, analogies are great with this. So we talk about data catalogs, and whenever you put data, it seems sort of just maybe complicated and, and hard to understand, especially for non-technical users. But we use catalogs all the time, and just like the card catalog. I mean, there has been Sears Robux catalogs that were mailed to people's house, right? That idea of a catalog isn't complicated. So we use product catalogs all the time. I'm a I'm a big skier from Colorado, and it's almost ski season, so I thought this would be a fun analogy. I'm a telemark skier, and I was looking for some telemark ski boots. So if we kind of think of you know, what is involved in a product catalog, there's some analogies that I'll, I'll go a little later also with um, data that why do I go to, you know, this was Amazon, probably pretty obvious, I think that's fair to say. Um, I want to just find my ski boots. So, so the area, the ease, ease of use that I can just go to a box and type Telemark ski boots and get all of the major vendors and all of the, the current list of ski boots um, that I could purchase right now is huge. Um, that's why it's a, a, one of the leaders in the market. It's easy to get that. I can also, though, look into the product details. If I want to see what kind of plastic it's made out of and who the vendor was and the price and the size and all of that, you can drill down into those details, but it's really easy to find. Once I do find it, I can obtain it or purchase it or get it. And that's one of the beauties of these product catalogs. Like I can, I see it, I buy it. Maybe some of you on the call kind of wish it weren't so easy because your credit card would, bills would be <laughs> lower. Um, but that is one of the beauty of this. It makes it simple, complex information really simple. I type in ski boots and I get everything back. Um, there is a bit of data management, though, in any of these product catalogs. You'll see that it's sort of organized by subject area. Is this part of outdoor goods? Is it part of recreational goods? Is it part of women's fashion? <laughs> well, in Colorado, it could be baby goods. People start pretty early with kids skiing, right? So, but how do you group 
that, that that's a, a nice thing of the product catalog. I'm looking for women's outdoor wear for summer, right? Some of the other things that we're all familiar with, like this, bought this, or this idea of reviewing related items. So clearly someone knows that I want ski boots, I probably need a strap to carry these ski boots, right? So can I, can I buy that as well? The other nice thing we're all familiar with with any social media is this idea of collaboration. And, and similarly in the data catalog world, um, one of them is, is relevance and ranking of, of who liked this. Is this relevant to me? Can I collaborate with other users? If I were to drill down into this, I could see reviews that maybe it got a you know one star ranking from people because they said you know the size on the package is, is too tight. You order a size higher. Super inf super helpful because what the product detail says may not be the same as when you actually use the product and have that kind of contextual information. So. Maybe that was all obvious, and you might be wondering why, why I explained a, an Amazon search page. But it hopefully will be relevant as we go ahead. One of the things to consider, this was the flashy front end of a product catalog. And if you who are in retail or doing any data design for retail realize there's a lot of work, or anyone who does any, any studies of these, there's a lot of work to get this data right. Um, so, for example, this ski boot, the fact that you had the right SKU, the right product name, the right price and description, that's master data. There was a whole lot of work to make sure that I got the right brand of the ski boot, that two brands didn't show up, um, that it had the right product description. There might be a document management system to get the pictures right and or a product information management PIM system, right? A lot of information there. There's operational data. Once I purchase this, there's going to be a purchase history of what I had. There's reference data to say what are the common departments, regions, brands, who created these categories that said it was baby goods versus outdoor goods, right? Um, and there's a whole semantic layer of who created the data model of all of the, is it brand, is it price, and what are the fields we even show? What's the organizational structure of this? How do we do either data science or NoSQL or, you know, recommendation engines? There's a lot of stuff behind this, right? So to bring this back to the data world, my analogy is this is the data catalog, a fake one. I made it up. This is not a particular tool. Um, but you should see some similarities in the different areas. Um, so you have a search, so just almost like the Google search, I just type in customer. Pretty simple. I get back all of the table information around customer. I get the definitions, all of the columns and data types. This is fairly, as I said, this isn't a specific tool, but it's fairly common information that you would see in any data catalog, right? But this is, to my earlier point, this is metadata about the data, right? But you can also see what's the other related information. There's certain views that people have written maybe a view to see just the customer demographics or the customer address. What a lot of these, de these, these data catalogs do now, we've all kind of embedded Amazon type <laughs> of catalogs in our brain, kind of these ranking or, or usability or likability, because just like that example when I bought the ski boots and they seem great in the picture, but I bought them and the, the sizes run small and the sort of, you know, maybe that was helpful for me to know. Or maybe people said I bought it and it broke two months later, right? This is, yes, there's, maybe there's two queries about customer demographics, but this one's really helpful. This is the one I really use in the field, right? Or this one, not so much. You can see that people aren't really using it. Um, so getting that idea of collaboration around data can be super helpful. And that's what a lot of these data catalogs can offer. You can also see some of the related actual dashboards themselves. A lot of these tools can link things like the, the what this is a table, what what dem, ugh, what dashboards use this table. We can see there's a customer demographics query. There's a top customers by region, and many of these tools you can just click on that dashboard and bring it up in Tableau or Click or, or whatever. You'll also see just like. Um, with the product catalog, you can kind of group it by different subject areas or business areas, and that's generally something you can customize within the tool, and you want to make sure that the tool you pick can be easily customized that way. Um, and then back to the point, is it data or metadata? Generally, there are data assets or trusted data sets you can get. What are all of the customer tables? 
that I can access, or tables related to customer, or views about customer, or dashboards written for customer. And that's some of the metadata that links you to these trusted data sets. So this idea of a trusted data set is, we'll talk more about governance, uh, a very important part of the catalog because, as you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? So be careful when you're designing your data catalog. Is this truly a collaboration source where I have my data scientist writing views and saying, hey, this sort of worked, great idea. Um, why don't you try this query? Oh, didn't work for me. I'm going to give it a two-star rating. That can be a very helpful use case for your analysts, and I've had several customers use them in this way. Productivity went up, use, reuse went up, because people are actually talking with other people writing these queries um, and getting some buy-in. But just think through that carefully. Or, or and or, are there certain trusted data sets where you want to be very specific and say, no, 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 this is the customer demographics query. This has been vetted. There is no other query that's going to be valid. When we're talking about customer segmentation, this is the approved definition, and this is the query we'll be using. Both are valid. Just make sure that the tool you pick or the implementation of your tool, you've given that thought so that you don't create more chaos and that the collaboration is actually adding value and not noise, and that should be obvious. But the, the other nice thing a lot of these tools have, whether it's a metadata repository or a data catalog, is this idea of a discussion forum. Can, can, can people give feedback? Um, so some of it, you know, and I, we've all probably done this who have been in the business for a while. We just spent months creating this perfect description of what a customer is. It's deduplicated individuals who've purchased one or more products within the past 18 months. Um, and then someone who's actually using the data, Joe, says, but what about LAPS customers? Where do I find that? Great. That's Excellent feedback. Maybe that maybe Joe isn't on the governance committee. Maybe we don't even know who Joe is, but he's clearly doing some work in the field that we wouldn't have got gotten before, and that's a great usage of this collaboration. And getting that mix right is excellent because what you don't want to do is create this encyclopedia that's old and dry and dusty and is out of date. Um, so having this idea of the best of both worlds and adding some of that Wikipedia-type collaboration can be great. Um, it could just be, hey, it, some of these um, data catalogs that are more kind of analyst productivity-type side of things, anyone have a good query for a net promoter score or MPS? People can publish that out there. It almost becomes more of a GitHub type of thing. Where you're, that's where you're actually sharing some of these data-related assets. Here, use my query. I've tried this out. Um, huge productivity gain. So hopefully that kind of makes sense with that analogy, and I have kind of spelled it out on, on the slide later. But some of the same things that you might find in Amazon, right? I can easily search and discover what I want. You know, I'm not looking at ski boots here, but show me everything about customer. Here's all the tables, the columns, the views about customer. I can look at the detailed quote, product specifications, right? What are the columns? What are the data types? And this can be huge. I mean, and, and again, think of your maturity as an organization and how strict you need to be. Maybe you don't need a full metadata repository. Maybe just getting the definitions for the core customer tables that people need, then that can be huge, uh, just even publishing that out. Um, we, we've all worked in organizations where many people are not malicious about going against standards, but people are busy, right? So if you can just say, here's the vetted description of customer data, and here's the columns, and here's where you can get it, I think people will be more than happy to increase their productivity and use it. Um, so us often just publicizing it can do a lot for consistency and data quality. That said, having this idea of, of ranking and, and who's using it, um, and this can be several ways. It can be sort of the like button of kind of, yes, I found this helpful. Some other tools will actually do usage ranking, how many people have actually downloaded and used this, so you can kind of see people speaking with their actions. Um, this kind of, you like this, you may also like this type of functionality. You search for customer. You may look, want to see the dashboards related to customer, the views related to customer, et cetera. Um, again, this idea, idea to organize by business area, just like with the ski boots. Is it part of health and beauty or is it part of outdoor goods? Um, you define that yourself. And that this is a whole part of implementing your data catalog that most products have, but you need to define that in the most intuitive way. Is this by 
organizational area, marketing, sales, development, as in this case, or is it by customer, product, you know, more domain areas? You can define that, um, but just give that some thought uh, before you roll it out, um, because how you kind of define these subject areas can really help with the usability. Um, what data assets do we want to have out on our kind of catalog? Is it the actual tables themselves? Is it the, the views on those tables or the dashboards? And then again, the collaboration is a huge part of the value of these. That can we actually see what people are using on the field? So con contrast that to the types of features that are in a metadata repository. So the metadata repository has obviously some similar features. You know, you're going to have the web portal. You can you can kind of generally do some sort of search and reporting. I think some of the difference, again, it being a continuum. Um, this idea of the, some of the matching and the reuse logic, some of the automated interfaces to other tools, having more of a robust meta model that you can sort of understand uh, some of the rules and, and create them so that you are a little bit more prescriptive and this is the definition of um, customer and these are the five fields and I've locked it down and I've published out the business rules. Some of the benefit of doing that uh, in a lot of these more metadata repository type tools can do some sort of impact analysis or data lineage, um, with generally automated through scanners or whatever they call their interfaces. Uh, so maybe the classic is, you know, I have a, a report that, you know, total sales by region. How is that calculated? So what a lot of these tools can do, assuming you use sort of SQL and industry standards, that you know, here's the field that it was in the warehouse, it went through the staging area, this is the ETL that was done on it, these are the source systems, and you can really see a nice view of that. It doesn't have to be your classic data warehouse. It could be I had it on a file, I moved it up to AWS in the cloud, and then we moved it to cold storage. Depending on your use case, it's another important thing to remember where I've seen some customers get into trouble is they like the tool, they like the UI, but really do a robust inventory ahead of time of what your environments are. Maybe it works great for this data warehousing use case, but maybe that's not your use case. Maybe it is S3 buckets on AWS, does the tool show that kind of lineage? You're using, you know, Google Sheets. <laughs> can it help you there? Um, and, and that's something to really consider. The other thing it can, a lot of these tools can do, especially when you have some of these impact analysis, is what's the effect of a change? I have a field, you know, first name, character 20. I'm going to change that to character 25. Before I do that, what am I going to break? And, and yes, I've still seen that happen even in, even this year at <laughs> a client, but that still happens. Um, did anyone think that through, that we changed a product code length and we broke the system or, or there's downstream impacts? So having these tools to be able to kind of show that uh, up front and, and to be able to do that analysis before you make the change can be really helpful. Um, the other piece of these metadata repositories or data catalogs, uh, and both have this, a lot of the tools have this now, is this idea of machine learning or metadata discovery or cringe at saying AI, but you, that, they'll, they'll call it AI, um, but this automation. And any of you who have been in the field, well, even, even con now a lot of people are doing this through spreadsheets. So I want to see everywhere that social security number is used in the systems. Do I have some poor data analyst going through and manually doing a spreadsheet of everywhere that you know, social security number is used? Um, it's probably not the best use of that. So what a lot of these machine learning tools can do is kind of do pattern matching that I know that in the U.S. a social security number is sort of three numbers and then two numbers and, and then three more numbers. Uh, and so it can kind of start to see those patterns and, and self-discover so that you can say this is all the places that social security number can be used. Uh, a lot of kind of the security tools can do this as well, and, and there's some overlap there too between metadata and some of those security type tools. Uh, but this is a great way to kind of get started and, and to do a lot of that menial work that you can self-discover. Um, Although think back that sometimes you want to do specific mapping rules. So in some case, you want to just have it say, show me everything that looks like an email address, and, and I can classify that. Sometimes you definitely do want your own matching rules 
and, and that I would kind of classify more into that metadata world, where I want to say when it says SSN underscore NUM, that is going to match to social security number. Or I want to call, maybe a business example, I want to call anything that his client should be mapped to customer because that's a business rule I know. A machine can't necessarily do that. It can probably say that this looks like a person because it has a name, um, but there's certain business rules that you might want to code and match for, and just make sure that the tool you purchase can do that if that's a, a need for you. I think maybe the analogy is everyone loves Google search um, because I can quickly search for ski boots, right? But sometimes I want to say, no, I only want blue ski boots and women size 10 from this one vendor, more of that SQL-based search. Sometimes it's harder to do that um, if the tool doesn't use that. So make sure that you understand your use case on these matching, that yes, automated machine learning is great, saves a lot of time, and can find things that you may not have discovered. Um, but also, if you do want to do your predefined either name matching rules or pattern matching rules, that there's some customization there as well. So the use case around this, I, I did want to make some distinctions in, in what is which. You know, is it metadata? Is it data catalog? But again, I, I like to look holistically because if this lady in the middle is your typical kind of self-service business analyst, generally that type of person wants to see a lot of things. Um, I want to know, are there glossaries? Are there data models? Are there business rules um, around this? What, what is the definition of a customer versus a client? Um, that can be a glossary. That can be a data model. Um, and more in the data catalog type, if there is a master data set, I would love to use that. Tell me what is the vetted list of <clears throat> valid customer or valid product codes or valid state codes. Um, is that in the warehouse? Is it in the master data? Is it in the reference data? I think often there seems to be this false dichotomy of oh, we're in the self-service, uh, quick analytics, data science world. We don't need things like master data. I would think most data scientists I've worked with, um, if you can just have a clean list of country codes, could I just use it so I don't you know, have my PhD or master's in, in statistics and I'm spending time cleaning up you know, list of country codes. Can we get it one place? So I, I think that's a nice balance to remember that there is a <laughs> there is that encyclopedia and Wikipedia. <laughs> Make sure to get it in the right spot. That yes, if it's our product SKUs and our product codes um, and names, probably a good thing to standardize um, and publish them out in the data catalog as sort of a trusted vetted list and be very clear about that. Um, but there is also this self-service approach um, where maybe that's more of your crowdsourcing data cataloging. I'm just spitballing here. I just am trying some queries. I've done some analysis. Hey, I think that's cool. You might want to try it too. too. And so that's where you want to give a little thought in your tools of either just being very clear, this is a trusted data set, and this is something we are just testing out, um, and, you know, this is... Uh, you know, just be very clear in your definitions. And I think that, you know, the average self-service user probably wants a combination of all of that, as long as we're very clear. So I, I did, I would be remiss if I did not mention data governance um, because there's great tools around data cataloging. Picking the right one obviously can be very important, um, but none of that is going to be good without good data in it, and good data requires good data governance. So give this some thought before you publish, are you going to create a monster? Um, who are the data stewardship roles for these curated data sets? And I, I didn't show that in my example, because uh, it was just a fictitious one, but often there's a place for that table, is who's the data steward or data owner for that table? Who's responsible if I think this field is a wrong definition or a wrong data type? I have a question about it, who I can go to. Um, a lot of my customers who have Implemented data catalogs, they sort of say, that, uh, you know, ironically, we're using technology. The biggest value was getting people together. One of my favorite stories was two analysts on the same massive oil company, multinational, you know, thousands of employees. Um, they used one of these data catalogs. People found out they were both doing some queries on some location data. Uh, through this data catalog, they started collaborating. It was one of those, oh, great, let's talk, where do you sit, what time zone are you in? Um, they realized they were on the same floor. 
<laughs> after all the years of the company, they didn't realize that they're you know several cubes down from each other, and they'd never collaborated on this stuff. Um, so that was a way where technology really helped. The, the value of it was, yes, the data they saw, but more the connection between people. So I, I be very conscious of how we can have these sort of who's the, the buck stops here owner when there's a problem, but also then how do we have these kind of collaborative feedback loops that anyone who's working on this data can kind of have these ways to work together. Um, if we're going to have published data sets on this catalog, how how do we say that's published? What What is the governance rule to say this is a standard approved data set or this is a standard you know, approved report, this is the analytical model we're using versus here's something cool you want to play around with. Um, and then that kind of ties into how you publish and distribute these different data sets. Uh, again, not to be my own Escher diagram of is it data or metadata. Uh, some of these tools can very easily store things like your reference data. Here is your list of country codes, download it. Um, but you know, think I, I wouldn't think of your data catalog as the place to store all of your data. Uh, I would think a massive organization is going to have things like warehouses and MDM hubs and you know better places to store the actual data. I don't think of it; you're moving it all there. It's more of a like a catalog. My product doesn't live on Amazon, right? I, I find my product on Amazon and then it goes. You know, that said, there are some products that live on Amazon. I can download an ebook, <laughs> so it sort of lives there. But in general, it's a pointer to something else. Um, it gives you your thoughts of these uh, life cycle and workflow. Maybe I have my trusted data sets, and then somebody in the example that I, I had said, that's a great definition of customer, but I think you missed a piece. How does that piece of feedback then go to the right data governance committee, get vetted, approved? Back, fed back into maybe a change in the definition. Um, how does a discovery data set that your data scientists found then get published to a trusted data set that, no, this is a new piece of data we found, I'd like to share it, um, and, and all of that uh, pieces in between. So again, the tools can be slick. The tools only work if the data is slick, and the data is only slick if you have great governance behind it and the right rules. Um, I've shared this slide before, but I think it's it can be really helpful in kind of getting some context around where do I put what where. Um, so, and again, it can also help you when you're thinking of do I want more of the strict lineage metadata rules driven or the more collaborative analytic discovery sharing model is to think that there's different types of data and different types of governance. So. If I'm up at my master data and reference data level, you know, this is the list of all of our customers or all of our vendors, all of our patients or our doctors, right? You want to make sure that's right. If this is, you know, your list of physicians who have been validated to do surgery at a certain hospital, I would certainly want that to be vetted really carefully uh, through master data. And yes, maybe that list is out on your data catalog of you know where I can find the master list of physicians, but that should only be published out there when it's been vetted and very carefully approved with a defined data steward and a process for promotion. Similarly, something like core enterprise data, I might put your data warehouse in that category. Um, some of your you know, financial metrics you're, you're publishing. If we are going to say this is the definition of total sales and that is being fed back to the street, I would think that's a vetted KPI that everybody would want to have had approved before you put that out in your catalog. But then there's some grayer areas or light blue area, I guess, more literally. Um, and there's some data that's still structured to still be vetted, but maybe each department has their own operational reporting that maybe that doesn't have to go up to the whole steering committee before you publish it to the catalog. Maybe they can just say, this is you know, our own internal data. I'd like to share it, but it's been semi-vetted or, <laughs> again, use your own terminology there. But then one of the benefits of these catalogs is this idea of exploratory data and, and sharing and ad hoc and, hey, I tried this query, what do you think? Does anyone have a good model for X, Y, Z? Um, and that's where you get some of the discovery. So I want to be clear in where some of these tools can help with, uh, some of its process, some of its tool. Some of it's publishing. I have reference data. I'm sure analysts want to see that. Everyone across the company wants to see that. But maybe something was found in this that started as exploratory data, 
but then maybe we want to store that in our master data or in our warehouse. There should be some sort of promotion, oh, sorry about that, um, up to being a trusted data set. How do you get to be a trusted data set? And be really clear uh, where you have that sort of verified button. Uh, make sure you understand the process behind that. Um, so, in summary, for some of that, and I know there's a lot of questions, so I wanted to give some time for that. Um, data catalogs are great. They're growing in popularity partly because of this rise in that self-service user. It's a really intuitive way to get access to all of these enterprise data sets. Um, the idea that this I, of collaboration and feedback and, and the intuitive nature of it with things like like buttons and discussion threads can be great. Uh, but just be careful of don't don't go too much into the flash <laughs> and not and to forget things like your data governance and um, to maintain that and understand your use case before the choosing the tool. I think if you if I were to give one piece of advice as we leave this call um, and you're looking to do a tool for your catalog is to give that some thought. Are you going the rigorous standard approach or the looser collaborative approach or somewhere in the middle? And do I want the best of both worlds? Um, because the, I will guarantee you these will be popular once you put them out there. So make sure that you've got the right data and the right process behind it before you go too far. Um, uh, are obligatory a bit. Uh, join us next month. Uh, we'll, we'll be going more into data modeling, uh, both from the business side and the technical. And yes, some of these data modeling tools can almost can be seen as a data catalog, and some of these tools have sort of front ends that could be such. I didn't cover that in this, um, but you know, the, on that idea of overlap between tools, uh, a lot of a lot of data modeling tools are saying that, well, you know, there's a lot of metadata already in the data model. Can I publish it out? So if you're interested in data modeling, that'll be next month. And again, um, anything in the past has been on demand and will be on demand. Um, we do this for a living if you need any help. <laughs> and um, I will now open it up to Sharon if you want to ask Shannon if you want to um, ask some questions. Thank you, Donna, for another fantastic presentation. Great as always. We've got a lot of questions coming in. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, uh, I will be sending a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day um, Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this presentation along with anything else requested throughout. Now, um, Donna, you went into this a little bit, but what's your opinion on difference between data catalog and data dictionary? And do you see a data dictionary having multiple distinctly different uses? Um, good question, and I probably could have, yep, there's a lot of different flavors of governance and dictionary. So, um, which one do I want to go back to? We kind of talked about data catalog and metadata repository, but you're right. Let me go on and find one of my slides. I would say a data dictionary, and everyone has different definitions, is more on the technical side. And on the slide that I showed where it basically just had sort of your tables and columns and what those tables and columns mean, uh, to me that's a data dictionary. Right? I want to understand uh, the, the fields and columns um, in my database, if we're using databases, what the structure is and what they mean. To me that's almost your classic data dictionary. I think these, these data catalogs have an aspect of that. Um, um, but they go a lot more. So sort of, sorry, all the markup here, but if if I sort of have this section here, this kind of table column data type description, <laughs> I'm going to make it even uglier. Um, this to me is sort of the data catalog portion of that. I think the catalogs are kind of a superset of that. Um, probably a follow-on question, and I saw one of the questions come through, but what about business metadata? I think glossary is another piece of this business glossary. So here I used a table kind of example. What do we mean by customer? Um, but this could very well be a glossary of what are all our terms? What do we mean by customer? What do we mean by client? Um, all of that is another kind of subset of, of these tools. And is there uh, experience with combined metadata repositories and data catalogs if available? Yes, so that sort of gets back to the slide that I just moved off of. Um, I think most of these tools are a continuum. Um, so a lot of the more traditional metadata repositories are adding a lot of this more catalog type functionality. And I think some of the catalogs are adding the more robust things like data lineage. So definitely it's the spectrum, as I mentioned on the bottom, um, 
but just give that some thought. If you, and again, this may be some false distinctions, um, but I thought it was a helpful way to just kind of think of the which end of the spectrum you're on. If you're really going into the technical lineage, there's some good tools that do that. And, and if you really want to go into the user front end collaboration, there's some excellent tools for that. And then there's some pieces that do kind of both sort of well, <laughs> um, but just kind of think your use case. So yeah, definitely there's overlap between these. And Donna, will a catalog usually contain the permitted values within a data element? For example, if gender contains M, F, X, D, are they listed with definitions? They certainly can be, and that again, then I start to feel like this. So is it a metadata catalog, a data catalog, a reference data set, your master data set, valid values? But yes, I, I think that most of these tools have some of that functionality. I would just be careful of when is it more reference and math? You know, MF is sort of a kind of valid list, and, and there's a lot of ways you can do that. Once you're getting into maybe country codes or more reference data, just make sure you're labeling as such, and, and you want to put it in the right spot. But most, many of these catalogs have aspects of that as well. Um, so yes, that's a great place to say these are the, the valid values for these fields is often a really great part of the definition. And sometimes it's the best definition. You know, I don't know what gender is. Well, it's male, female. I can kind of understand by the list of what that is. You know, it's not self-identified. It's not transgender, right? That would be different. So just by giving the example, sometimes it's the best definition. So yeah, huge fan of putting those in. A lot of great questions coming in here. So how does one uh, select between um, uh, char and and var and very and Char and Varchar, V-A-R-C-H-A-R, -A -A in this scenario. What if there are more than 20 characters in the given customer's name? Does it just cut out the rest? Um, I would I would just say that's a design decision. So I just gave it what the data catalogs can do is publish what is out there. I think what they a good point that was brought up is often that's not the reality of what's in the field. So what some of these, I would put that more on the metadata repository spectrum. It can say the standard is character 10. Um, and, and I guess to answer that direct question, if, if, if the field is character 10 and your, your name is character 12, it's going to get cut off. And so that's why you want to give some thought into the definitions of that what these metadata repositories are, can often do with lineage and say the defined definition is character 10, but we can see that in your field, in, in your environment, there's 16 different variations of that. One, you know, your Oracle system is character 12 and your Sybase system is, uh, dates me, Sybase, uh, character 25 or whatever. And can see, because you can't, as you know, any DBAs in the call, you can't just randomly change fields uh, without some impact analysis, so it can do that. Um, but but var car versus car is a design decision. It has to do with kind of spacing and how much you know. If you're not going to use those fields, I think with most modern technologies that becomes a little less important. Um, but that and that's a great part for the, this collaboration. It could say that you know, I'm saying that you have a length of. Your last name is character 20. Well, we have a lot of Indian clients and a lot of Indian last names that are really, really long and it's going to you know, be too short. And that's a great way where you think you have a standard, but until you actually have these discussion forums, maybe you never thought of that because you were only doing business in the UK um, or something like that. So anyway, a lot to think about there. Definitely. So uh, when building a glossary, should I start with a scan for data lineage or a business steward to define a term that is uh, later aligned with the system scan? I'm not sure I understood the question. Could you read that again? I'm sorry. <laughs> Absolutely. So when building a glossary, uh, should I start with a scan for data lineage or a, a business steward to define a term that is later aligned with the system scan? Oh, if I understand that correctly, I think I think you can do both in parallel. Um, what a lot of these terms, what these repositories can do is, if I'm understanding it correctly, there is a term, and I'm going to say it's social security number, and there's somebody who defines what that is. And then maybe someone says, well, no, we're in Canada, it's social insurance number, whatever. But so we have the right definition of what that term is, where it means, how it's used. That should be done by your, your business data steward. Uh, there's a whole 
um, you know, what are the most important critical data elements that can be defined. In parallel, you can do a search and that's where a scan or whatever you want to call that reverse engineer of what systems in the organization have social insurance number and <clears throat> that's where some of this machine learning can help discover some of that and that what some of these tools can also do, that might be a good link to this one, is some of that automated matching um, where again you can either define when it says customer I want to link that to client because that's the improved term now. We used to call it customer and now it's called client. You may want to manually do that. Or maybe you want the system to help you automate match that. But what these tools can often do is say the business term is social insurance number. And here's the 17,000 fields. One of them is called field one that actually has social insurance number in it. Um, so I think you can do those both in parallel. Um, but I, I think it should be driven by the business priority because you don't want to do that for everything. That's another good piece of advice for these uh, based off the business value. A lot of these tools can do a full inventory. You, you push it against your systems, it'll scan back a full inventory of all your systems. That can be helpful, but is it overwhelming? And so you might want to use your governance and business data stewards to help prioritize what are the buckets we really want to publish. You know, because I, I, want to, I want to search for ski boots. I want the five ski boots I want. If I saw a thousand ski boots, I'd, I'd get overwhelmed and leave and not buy any. Same thing with data. You want to make it approachable. And Donna, you talked a lot about data at rest, um, but I also see a need for data in motion, for example, in queues or web services and other APIs, for example. Um, do today's data catalog products handle these use cases as well? I have generally seen that, I mean, it'll be the specification for the API for the, that data, but it's not necessarily tracking the data. It'll track the, here I go, the metadata about that data in motion that I have either an ETL script or uh, an API that passes that data across and what the format of that data is in moving. So in that sense, um, uh, where is my messy example? I shouldn't use these drawings. Um, you know, here ETL is data in motion, but it's not saying which data is moving. Um, it's more that this is the ETL script that I use to define that data or that type of thing. Um, but generally it is, in my experience, kind of a data at rest kind of thing. And can metadata tools feed data catalog tools? Can metadata tools feed data catalog tools? Yes, theoretically, yes. Um, or, or I guess, yeah, or, or you pick a tool that does sort of both. I mean, it gets back to this picture is that, yeah, it's, there's often a multi-faceted approach. So I have worked with some customers that, you know, your, your data warehousing team is going to, and again, when you're looking at these tools, think of your audiences. Some of these metadata tools, I can nerd out all day on them because they're fascinating. I can do a full lineage of all the system scripts and all the data types, that's what your data warehouse team is going to salivate over. Your your business team, the self-service user, is probably going to run away from that. So in that sense, you've got that tool that's doing the kind of full-on lineage, and then some of these data self-service can either go against the same data set, but just do it at a higher level, or theoretically there can be some integration between you know, you're more technical and that higher level. But it, to me, it's probably a different tool uh, with a different use case. I mean, some of the, I'm just thinking a lot, some of them have partnerships, you know, with some of these more uh, technical scanners or whatever they call it. You know, it's maybe it grew up as a data catalog and then they, they partner with some of the technical tools to do that full lineage is probably the answer to that. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, that's good. Um, so can data lineage tools allow you to better define data or um, would the script be the primary resource used when cataloging data? Uh, yeah, I think that's a great question that kind of ties into my other messy picture here of, and again, there can be different environments or different, just be clear what you're doing. There can be sort of, a, you can use these metadata tools or catalogs as discovery. I want to see what's out there. What is the lineage? And you could define it's a mess. <laughs> and then you can use that to have, but the approved lineage is X. So a lot of these tools, you know, I sort of, just contradicted myself in a way. I said, you know, a bad use case is just to scan everything and and try. That's a bad use case if you're trying to publish it out to end users. But if you're the technical team and you really have no idea what's in these systems, 
that can be a huge benefit to these. I see that more in the metadata repository side, um, but that can be a huge benefit to kind of use it as a discovery tool. And a big question here for you, Donna. We've got six minutes left. I think we can do this. How do you populate the catalog the very first time? How do you populate the catalog the very first time? Um, it sort of ties into that last question. If you're going to uh, on the technical side, most of these tools, and and don't buy one if it doesn't have it. I know <laughs> that's a strong statement, but they have these automated scanners or populated interfaces. So the benefit of buying these tools, I, I I have a, it could even be something like a COBOL copy book that someone wrote and retired. I have no idea what this is. Or this Oracle database and or my SAP system with a gazillion tables. They can point against these and reverse engineer it or whatever you want to call it and, and create that initial technical difficult, uh, dictionary or <laughs> there I used it, dictionary, metadata repository, inventory of things. That's sort of what you're paying for with these. Um, I, I would warn, some of these tools have such a nice slick editor user interface and when you kick the tires a bit, some of that automation isn't as strong as maybe you want. Because um, the other thing is, how do you then do it the next time? And that's where those metadata repository reuse rules are. Do you sort of trunk and reload? Do you update? Do you, you, know, you want to give that? Because it's really metadata, here I go, is just data, right? So almost like you populate a warehouse, you, you have some of those same decisions. On the business side, I think some of how you start to populate that is, is tied into your governance. What's going to have the best business value? Do I start with you know the sales data and get a great glossary around that? Often glossary is a great way to start because business users can really understand that. Um, if you're doing analytics and you're doing kind of that self-service discovery, maybe you let people populate that themselves. Just say it's out here. We're we're trying to collect all the coolest dashboards around customer. What do you got? You know so. Give that some thought. It was a great question. Um, I think from the business, you want to prioritize as, as the tech, but kind of the, the way you do that from the business point of view, I would type it in or maybe scan in spreadsheets that might exist. Um, from the technical point of view, it should be automated. And from the collaboration point of view, clearly that's people collaborating and just kind of let that happen. That's the Wikipedia. Maybe you don't want to populate. Maybe you want them to populate. Give that some thought. How are you going to kind of populate it through over time? Great question. And I think we have time to slip in one or two more here, Donna. Um, does data lineage of each attribute, um, is, it, is, is data lineage of each attribute at the data catalog level or data dictionary stage? The data lineage at the element level, um, I kind of see that at the data, metadata repository. Probably not even data dictionary. I see data, here we go, getting all nerdy about these terms. I see data dictionary as almost that static, that piece I showed with here's your tables and columns. To me, that's a data dictionary. And what they mean, to me, that's a data dictionary. I think when it gets to metadata repository, that's you're adding lineage and impact analysis between columns and, and ETL and, and all of that. You, some of, whether that's a catalog or a metadata repository, feels more like metadata repository to me, but some of these catalogs are really good at kind of doing both and just, um, what do you call it, abstracting it for the business user. So the business user says, here's your report. It comes from Oracle and in your ERP system. That's all you need to know. The technical team can drill into that same piece and see all the ETL scripts, but it's hidden from the business user. Um, so it depends on the tool, but I, I see it, that as a metadata repository kind of thing. <laughs> All right, Donna, well, that does bring us to the top of the hour here. Thank you so much for everything, and oh, it's always a great presentation. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything. We do have a lot of great questions coming in today. Uh, great topic, a very popular topic. So, uh, And just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Donna, again, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.